I think it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Quintilly? Yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? You know what I've got to say to you? Yes, but you don't say it. Oh, come do it. Will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. <laughs> How long you've been about it, I'm afraid you've had very little experience in how to propose. My own one, I've never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does, all my girlfriends tell me. <gasps> what wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They're quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that. Especially when there are other people present. Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come upon a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter she could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolen, will wait for me below in the carriage. Oh, Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolen. Mama. Gwendolen, the carriage. Yes, Mama. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men, although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite willing to enter your name should your answers be what a rally affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. Uh, what is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investment? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected from one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 acres, I believe. Oh, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people that make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Uh, well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. Uh, you have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolen could hardly be expected to reside in the country. I own a house in Belgrave Square. But it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back any time I like at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, 
She goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, uh, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number, Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Uh, do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us or come in the evening at any rate. Now, two minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, might be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... Well, I was found. Found? Yes, the late Mr... Thomas Cardew, an elderly gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. And where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, I was in a handbag, Lady Bracknell. A somewhat large, black leather handbag with, with handles to it. A very ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardio come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes. The Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I confess I am somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred, in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As to the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion. Indeed, has probably been used for that purpose more than once. But it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognised position in good society. May I ask you then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say that I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolen's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment it is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bradford. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel? Kindly open the door for me, sir. You will, of course, understand that for the future there is to be no communication whatsoever between you and Miss Fairfax. Good day to you, sir. Good day, Lady Bracknell. Oh, for heaven's sake, Algy, don't play that ghastly tune! How idiotic you are! Did it go off all right, old boy? Well, you don't mean to say that Gwendolen refused you. I know it is the way she has. She's always refusing people. I think it is most ill-natured of her. Gwendolen is right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we're engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. I've never met such a gorgon. I don't even know what a gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algie. 
I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. 